Hello, uh, in this session I will talk about fault injection as, as an oscilloscope, fault correlation analysis. This is work done by Albert Sprout, Alyssa Melbourne and me, Łukasz Chmielewski. This talk concerns both fault injection and side channel analysis. On the left side of this uh, title slide we can see an oscilloscope, a tool commonly used for fault injection. Here we see that it collects some side channel traces. On the other hand, we have our voltage glitching device that we will effectively use to produce traces that look like side channel traces. And actually, these traces here, this is not power consumption, this is actually a trace constructed using fault injection. Let me give an outline of our presentation first. Uh, at the beginning, I will show the problem statement, so how side channel analysis and fault injection coexist, and how possibly we can use side channel analysis techniques to generate new methods for fault injection. Then I will present our main technique. Uh, so I will show how we are constructing traces, like side channel traces from faults, and then how we apply uh, standard side channel techniques. This way we construct simple fault analysis called SFA and correlation for fault analysis CFA. These are the main results of the paper. Additionally, in the paper we consider also collision attacks and linear regression analysis. However, in this, um, in this, uh, in this presentation, due to time constraints, we will omit it. Subsequently, I will talk about our experimental setup and results from practical experiments. Um, next, uh, I will present, I will compare our results, our techniques to other various fault injection attacks presented in the past, so to related work. Uh, finally, I will conclude the presentation. The main message to remember from this presentation, we show how to apply existing side channel attacks in a purely fault injection setting by translating F fault injection results into probability traces. Uh, which are analog to standard power or side channel traces. For, for the details, and, and, and this presentation is quite brief, so for the details, I refer the listeners to the, uh, to the, to the article. There are two uh, kinds of side channel, passive and active. Passive case is if we essentially eavesdrop what the device does. It could be done via uh, either power consumption, electromagnetic emanation, time, uh, temperature, light, there are multiple ways. But the main thing is the device behavior became, be, it stays unaltered. So, for example, we have device uh, performing AES, we measure power consumption during these AES executions. That's all. That's, that's the side channel. Now, the other case that we see on the right, this is fault injection. In this case, it's similar in the sense that we again um, access the power line of a device, but then we inject there a glitch. So, for example, a, a, a dip in the power consumption at a very precise moment in time. By that, we alter the behavior of the device. It could be done using power, electromagnetic fault injection, or even lasers. The, uh, the passive case, uh, the, the, the attacks in the passive situation, are referred as uh, side channel analysis and in the active case they are referred as fault injection. What are the similarities and slight differences between these attacks? In general, in side channel analysis we have, uh, like, uh, we have many presented attacks that are quite often generic. They can work for various algorithms, some standard techniques. In case of fault injection, there are less publications and often the attack are tailored to either a very specific cipher, very specific case, or there are some strong assumptions being made about what the attacker can do or not. Now, um, since there are much more attacks in this side channel attack case, our research question here is, can we apply side channel attacks in the purely fault injection setting? And by that, obtaining many, uh, possibly many uh, attacks. This is the question that is answered in this presentation. Let us have a fast look how a typical attack, both fault injection and SCA, look like. Uh, 
First, of course, we need to build setup. That's the standard part. Then we need to perform a characterization. <coughs> what does it matter? No. What does it mean? It means that, uh, for example, if you want to do a search and analysis on AES, we probably will attack a first round of AES. We don't want to attack all 10 rounds of AES at once. This will take too much time. First round or even part of first round is enough. There are many uh, ways to do it. One is to look at some characterization traces. And the main message here is that we want to concentrate on non-profiled approach. So we are assuming that we just have a device. We maybe look at the traces, but we don't have a, a separate device on which we control the key and we can do some run various statistics. Now we just look at the simply at, at simply at the uh, at the how how the traces look and then we perform our attack. We don't want to have this uh, stronger power of profile case because it's in our in our it, it, it's less uh, uh, it's it, it's slightly less real, realistic. Then the second step of the attack is collecting data uh, uh, collecting data. In case of side channel, we simply an attacker simply would collect um, uh, power measurements using power uh, passive probes that could be also electromagnetic emanations, etc. In case of uh, glitching, uh, an attacker will use a VC glitcher or an electromagnetic fault injection glitcher or even a laser to perform fault injection and collect, uh, for example, faulty safer text from AES. Then, after the data are collected, the attacker, in case of such analysis, can run correlation power analysis or simple power analysis on the side channel traces that were connected. So these are some um, these are some uh, techniques for some statistical techniques to recover the uh, the, the, the key. Uh, the, in case of fault injection, an attacker can run differential fault analysis on AES to recover the secret key based on uh, faulty ciphertext that were collected during the previous step. What are the challenges? of a classical fault injection attack. First of all, jitter. This is quite practical that um, very often in practice we don't maybe have a perfect trigger for our fault injection attack or simply the device, the clock of the device jitter. So we don't always put the, we don't always, uh, we don't always perform fault injection exactly at the same time that we, exactly at the time that we want to perform it. There is randomness, hence there is noise. This is, uh, the, we, we need to overcome that problem. The other problem is no access to ciphertext. So sometimes our device performing AES maybe will not return at all ciphertext. And therefore we cannot mount a differential fault analysis attack. Ad additionally, there is so-called um, uh, fault injection um, uh, redundancy countermeasure. This is the situation when the AES is performed twice, the result of AES is compared in these two executions. If it's the same, then there is a, the ciphertext is returned. If it's not the same, it's not. In this case, um, we, essentially, the, the, there would need to be performed two fault injection attacks to succeed, and they would have to be done in the same way. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not easy. Uh, so in, in, in our work, we take these two challenges into account when we design our solution. We try to overcome so both jitter and fault detection countermeasure. How do we construct our probability traces from faults? Um, already more than 10 years ago, it was noted that the fault probability is dependent on the data being processed by a device. Additionally, this, of course this is true, but operation leakage would be also visible. It's, it's even much stronger because it means that the, uh, the different operations are being performed at the chip. So we expect that the fault probability would be also uh, also would depend on, on, on different operations that will be shown later on. What we do is we transform our voltage fault injection device into a single bit sampling oscilloscope. And from this result, from the single bits, we construct our probability traces. Let us have a look at the bottom at the power consumption trace of first round of AES on one of our targets. This is, uh, this is simply one AES power trace. Can we build something similar with fault injection? Ye yes, we can. We, in, in top, we have here uh, 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 such a trace. So what do we do? We go to the offset to first the time offset just after trigger 
and we run 15,000 times fault injection at this, uh, at this point in time. Then we construct a bar chart here, so we measure how many um, successful fault injections we assume. And then we move minimally more in time. Again, we do 15,000 fault injection times against 15,000 fault injections. And we continue like that till the end of the trace. We maybe performed a lot of fault injection tries, but we see that, the, that we effectively constructed trace similar to the power trace. This, this trace could be used, for example, for characterization. Now, how do we do data collection? So first of all, we need to decide where we want to glitch. And second, we need to decide what glitching power do we use. How did we, uh, we decided to use very uh, non-profile approach for special glitching power. We, um, we simply uh, glitch with very wide parameters of power and then we choose, uh, for our experiments, we choose the power around when we achieve 50% of mute. So when, when the device stops answering 50%, that's the moment where that's more or less the center of our power that we use and then we only randomize it slightly around that, uh, that value. How do, we, um, how do we recognize successful fault injections to build our traces? We use two approaches. One is called mute approach and the second one is success probability. Let us talk first about success probability because that's coming from related work. This is, sim this is simply an information whether the ciphertext produced by AES that is running on our device is, uh, is correct or not. If it's incorrect, then we assume this was successful fault injection, that's what we used to produce our trace. And uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise it was not successful fault injection, it was correct execution. Now, in case of muted, that's, um, that's model introduced by us. In this case, we just assume that the device doesn't answer or reset. So the device is really, uh, the fault injection really um, stopped the, uh, the, the, the device from executing. The, the, uh, from executing the AES for returning the result. Okay, um, I, will, uh, I will explain later how we use it to achieve successful attack. What also is important to consider is in this, in this model for each plain text, we apply multiple fault ejection at the same point in time and then we need to repeat for different points in time. And this way we obtain an estimate on the probability of a fault occurring. That's how it would be in the ideal case. On the next slide, I will explain what, how we do it slightly differently to uh, perform less fault injections. The number of points of fault injection, it's essentially like a desired resolution of our probability trace, similarly like in side channel analysis, and the number of fault injections at the specific point, it gives us the precision of our measurements. Let us talk about uh, first about the concerns in trace constructions. As mentioned before, there could be jitter, noise, the domain can be very sparse, then it would cause that we need a lot of fault injections. Another issue, since um, PLLs are often enabled in practical targets, uh, it, the, 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 uh, the jitter may occur not only to the trigger issues, but it also could occur due to simply the, the clock being not completely stable to various effects. Furthermore, we don't really analyze the software that is running on our, uh, on our targets. We use more black box, fire and forget approach. Um, also for, for practical reason, because the attackers often don't really know what software is running on a device. To overcome the above uh, concern, the above problems, we perform the trace construction slightly differently than in the ideal case described on the previous slide. First, we used uh, bucketing of the results. It corresponds to the oversampling in the side channel analysis case. We divide the attack window that we chose, so for example, first round of AES, into buckets of equal duration and calculate combined fault probability for that buckets. What might be a problem with that approach, with that point alone, would be that there could be uh, aliasing. So essentially we need to apply sort of a low pass to this situation. So this would be a problem if, for example, leakage would happen just 
on the edge of two different buckets. Therefore, we simply overlap buckets. That looks a bit like low pass in case of side channel analysis, and that's uh, that's our method. After we have the traces, we can perform in quotes uh, any side channel attack. We will show two attacks. We believe many other attacks can be also performed, but most likely not any. Let me talk about our experimental setup. We have uh, uh, our PC. PC communicates via serial communication with our targets. It also instructs via USB our glitching device that provides power to the target and can cause glitches. How our, uh, how our glitcher is being triggered? It's triggered by the last byte of the serial communication being sent from PC to the target. Sometimes, we, in, in few experiments, we also use target directly generating the, 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 the trigger here to the device to cause the glitch, but usually we use the communication. We consider three different software targets. So these are AESs, and this, uh, so these are AESs or RSA running on an AVR, 32-bit ARM, or RISC-R vCPUs. And we also uh, perform a proof of concept analysis on X Mega hardware AES engine. Our setup is low cost, it costs less than $50, even together with targets, I believe. The, um, uh, the description of that is uh, under following link if someone is inter interested, and the picture of that setup is, is of a similar setup is shown here. This, this is a picture from that website. Let us have a look at simple fault analysis that is, uh, that is based on simple power analysis on RSA. Here we have such a characterization trace similar to before, constructed in the way described in previous slides. Um, this is just a square and multiply implementation of RSA, and we can I hope we can see that the patterns here are different. In case of light green patterns, they correspond already to processing of zeros and the dark blue patterns corresponds to ones. This, uh, this, was, uh, this is simple fault analysis. What we also done subsequently is fault correlation analysis on different implementations of AES on different architectures. In, uh, on the, in, in, in top, we see um, analysis of, uh, on, on risk V of a straightforward AES implementation. In case of mutes, we need around 30, 35 million fault injection attempts. In case of the success case, so when we know whether ciphertext was correct or not, we need around 20 million traces. Similarly, for ARM architecture, we need um, we need uh, we need uh, 80 million traces, and and um, slightly less in case of um, uh, when we know whether ciphertext was correct or not. What we can notice in this picture is that actually mutes require slightly more traces, but clearly the key can be also recovered. Um, what's also important to mention, but that's more uh, emphasized in the paper, is if we would know a bit better where we need to include the fault to generate, to recover the, the, uh, the, the key to break the key, then the number of um, then the number of uh, fault injection attempts goes between five and thirty times down, depending on the architecture that we attack. Now let us have a look at the uh, at the at, at the rest of our experiments. We attack here a, a, a optimized implementation form ARM. Again, we are able to recover the the uh, the key. And similarly, the, the, the hardest case was for X-Mega. For X-Mega straightforward AES implementation in the success model, we actually can recover the key with 16 million traces. However, in case of the mutes approach, we see that there is much, 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 much more noise. The, case, the situation is much more harder, but we still see clear um, entropy reduction in the key. Our last experiment was about attacking X Mega hardware AES. In this case, um, the hardware AES engine runs, separ runs in a separate crypto engine, and then there is also the main, the main chip, the main processor. 
This attack on this uh, side channel attack on this uh, on this target has been done was done more than 10 years ago by Ilya Kishvatov. He described in the paper the model that was used and he was acting the, the leakage model that he used in such an analysis and he was able to recover all 16 bytes. In our case, however, we used the same model, we used fault injection approach, but we noticed that we can recover only three bytes completely and, um, and the other bytes we don't see leakage. What could be the reason of that? We believe that the reason for that is that we set our glitching parameters to glitch the effectively the software, the CPU. We, don't, we, we, we didn't try to glitch the, the hardware, we just see whether the device answers or not. So could it be that we are glitching the, uh, the, 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 the main CPU? We have looked at the code that is running on main CPU during the execution of hardware AES. We noticed that there is a polling loop consisting of five instructions, and it seems that only one of these instructions, when we glitch, affects the results of the hardware AES engine in a substantial way that we can mount the attack. Therefore, intuitively, we can recover only every fifth, uh, fifth key byte. And that we can see here that that's probably the case because that's the only moment in time. Each five instructions we can see, for example, input, uh, input correlation. Therefore, we can say that this is just proof of concept, it's a partial success. How to solve it? Possibly by using wider range parameters and using more, much more fault injection parameters, we would be able to see this situation when we would be able to affect the, uh, using our fault injection to see this, this, this uh, fault sensitivity coming from the hardware AS engine. Um, we believe it's maybe a bit similar to clipping on quantization errors in case of uh, in case of side channel analysis at least related to that analogous analogous okay let us compare of various fault injection attacks to the uh, to our attack uh, our attacks are presented in the bottom row we can see it here what was for us the most important for us the most important was to have a generic solution with little assumptions that, for example, means that we would like to have um, a technique that uh, allows us to attack various targets. In our case, we were able to attack public and private key, uh, sorry, symmetric and asymmetric cryptography, and also a hardware AES engine, at least we showed a proof of concept. Many techniques also are applicable to many uh, different um, uh, uh, crypto primitives, for example, CIFA, safe error attacks, and differential fault analysis. We also wanted a non profile approach, therefore, fault template attacks are not really the, 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 uh, the approach that we, we, we were interested in or to, to, to have a similar approach. We also assume that due to the practical approach, we, we, we would like to show results that are in which we don't, don't have this clock control due to, due to PLLs being enabled. Many attacks are shown in this scenario when the control over target is quite large and that's hard to achieve in, in, in practice sometimes. We also assume no ciphertext knowledge, so there, there have been a lot of work when the when the, this, this marked here attacks, they only require ciphered correctness information. Uh, in our work, we only don't we achieve that, but also we have this new detection situation when we only need to know whether the device muted or not and that's actually enough to recover the key. All that flexibility comes unfortunately at the price of a large, larger amount of faults. There are other aspects discussed in the paper. Um, to conclude, we have presented a generic technique for translating side channel analysis to fault injection attacks. On the example of simple fault analysis based on SPA and correlation fault analysis based on correlation power analysis. We also investigated two different classification assumptions, mutes, mutes and successes. We successfully attacked cryptographic libraries running on three different targets, and we also presented a proof of concept against the hardware engine. Our priorities was to have generic attacks and practical, and the drawback is a relatively large number of fault injection attempts. These results show that the relationship between fault injection and side channel is strong, 
and we can run relatively unmodified side channel attacks on the results of fault injection campaigns. Thank you very much for listening.